few times while flying, I've had an opportunity to see some truly beautiful and marvelous things. I remember once flying into Arizona, and I got to see the Grand Canyon from the air, to see its cliffs and valleys. It was truly beautiful and wondrous. I remember flying over Iceland and seeing the glaciers in Iceland, miles and miles and miles of glaciers glowing almost blue in the sunlight. It's beautiful, marvelous. Perhaps the favorite thing I've ever seen from a plane came when we were traveling, flying over northern Canada. I had been fast asleep. For some reason, I woke up. I was in a window seat and had the shade drawn down. And it was the middle of the night. Didn't expect to see anything, but for some reason felt compelled to open that shade and take a look outside. And when I looked outside, rather than seeing nothing, seeing just darkness, I saw a light green glow in the background. So I watched. As our plane continued to move along the northern Canadian coast, it grew and grew and grew until this faint green glow turned something looking a little bit like this. Got to see the northern lights from a plane. First time and the only time I'd ever seen them. It's truly beautiful and marvelous as these northern lights danced over the plane wing. And as I watched them, these northern lights felt and looked more than just a bunch of charged particles. It felt like a gift. The first and only time I'd ever seen in my whole life, and it happened to be on a plane when I woke up in the middle of the night and opened up a shade. They were more than just charged particles, but were a great gift given to me in that moment. Gift. We're here at 10th, Christmas Eve, the final sermon of our series called Prepare Him Room, where we have been looking at, just like the puppets had talked to us about, what it involves to prepare room in our lives for the coming of Christ this Christmas season. And today we're going to look at how we can prepare room through joy. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew 2. You can also follow along on the screen behind me. Matthew 2, the story of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now we'll jump ahead to verse 9. After they, the Magi, had heard the king, King Herod, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went again of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for these words that have been faithfully passed on by the gospel writer Matthew, one of the 12 disciples, who likely heard them directly from Mary. We thank you that today we get to come to make space for an encounter with you and with the gift of joy. Amen. As we come to the passage, we meet a group of travelers called the Magi, sometimes known as the wise men or also called the three kings from that famous Christmas carol, We Three Kings. The word Magi is a, a technical term. In fact, during the Christmas concert afterwards, I had someone who is from Persia come over to me and say, did you know that the word magi is a technical term referring to pre uh, Persian priests and scholars? I said, you're absolutely right. Magi is a technical term, which refers to a group of priests from the Persian Empire, likely originating from the city of Babylon, which during this time was a part of the Persian Empire. And these priests, these magi, are some of the most unlikely people that 
we could encounter in a scripture about a Jewish king and Messiah. And the reason is that these magi were practicing astrology. They were practicing the different magical arts, all things that during this time would have been outlawed in ancient Israel. So here we have these unexpected outlaws, in a way, marching towards Jerusalem, some of the most unlikely figures possible. They travel on a journey of almost 1,200 kilometers. If we were to map it out in Google Map, which we'll do right here, you can see it would take around 260 hours to take this trip. Keep in mind, they didn't travel day and night. They traveled maybe for a, a few hours every day, often traveling during the night so that they could rest during the day when it was hottest. Keep in mind, too, that they would often take breaks for long periods of time for their animals to rest or to spend time with one another. This is a trip that could have taken between one to four months. We also know that it was a time that involved great preparation as well. As these magi would have likely first seen the star sometime around Christ's birth. But they didn't actually arrive to meet the Christ child and Mary until two to three years later trip that involved great preparation, two to three years of preparation to travel. And so we can infer, just given the great cost, given the great time, given the great preparation, that these magi weren't only following a star for its unique sight, but they had a purpose in mind. That they were looking for something behind the star, the destination of the star. They were looking for something more something that could meet and fulfill some of the deepest needs, not only of the world, but of their life and of their hopes and dreams. These magi were looking for more. We're told that then seeing the star in front of them, having traveled for one to four months, 260 hours of travel time soar on their feet, they finally see the star stop over a small town called Bethlehem. And when they do, knowing that the destination was in front of them, what are we told that they do? Told that they are overjoyed. And in fact, the translation that we read as overjoyed, I think undersells the original language and what it says. I think a better translation would be this that seeing the star in front of them stop over Bethlehem, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Joy upon joy upon joy. Not just so that they could rest their weary feet, but that many of their hopes and dreams were hopefully lying in front of them. The whole reason for their destination and journey was there. Joy can be a verb. Like the Magi, it can be something that they choose to seek out, to respond to, to follow. But joy can also be a noun. The original language, joy, shares the same root as grace. Grace, something given to us. Joy is something that we can choose to seek out, choose to respond to, but also given to us as gift. I know in my own life, that's certainly been true. I, like the Magi, am a very unlikely person to be here, especially preaching in front of all of you. Growing up, I didn't grow up in the church. I was not a follower of Jesus. In fact, Jesus was very much on the periphery of my life and my mind. Let me give you a story to embody this. When I was around nine, maybe 10 years old, we were visiting some family members. Uh, our, these family members, my aunts and uncles and cousins, all attended church, but our family didn't. And I remember my aunt asking me, Craig, do you know who Jesus is? I said, of course I know who Jesus is. He was that guy who was born in Bellingham, right? <laughs> See, I'd, I'd mixed up Bellingham, Washington in the United States with Bethlehem in Judea. <laughs> My parents thought this was the funniest thing they'd ever heard, and my aunt and uncle didn't. But it embodies that reality that for me, Jesus was very much on the periphery 
of my life. Fast forward 10 years, many of the decisions that I'd been making had not led to the life of fruitfulness and joy and meaning and hope that I had wanted. And I found myself looking for something else. Closest friend of mine, my best friend at the time, was a Christian, regularly talked in really honest and genuine ways about her faith in attending church. But seeing the fruitfulness of her own life, I wondered, maybe there's something to this life of faith that I should seek out myself. And I asked if I could attend church with her. She said, of course. So for a number of months, I attended church with their family. And if I'm honest, there were things that I really was drawn to and was compelled by, but many things too I was not. I wasn't sure if I wanted to follow this Jesus. But one day I remember driving in my work truck. I worked for the City of Vancouver Parks Board, which I don't know if that really exists anymore after that vote, but I worked for the Parks Board, was driving alone in my work truck southbound on Oak Street. It was the middle of rush hour, so it was kind of moving really slowly, and a question that someone that I had met at church had asked me was resonating in my mind. Have you ever said, I believe in Jesus? And I remember thinking at the moment, no, of course not. I didn't grow up in church. That sounds kind of a weird thing to say, but I just held on to it. And for some reason, this question was bouncing around in my mind and my heart. And I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to attend church and to pursue this path of Jesus anymore. And so I thought, you know what? I really have nothing to lose by saying I believe in Jesus. So as quietly as I could, I almost whispered, I believe in Jesus. In that moment, it was like a light turned on in my heart and a smile came on my face. I did the only thing that I thought you should do when that happens. Say it again. Say louder. I believe in Jesus. Again and again and again I said it until I was yelling, I believe in Jesus in my city of Vancouver work truck in rush hour traffic with the windows down. (laughs) I really cannot imagine what the other cars around me were thinking. The feeling was so overwhelming that I actually had to pull my work truck over off the road. I remember thinking there were certain things in that moment that I was in control of. I was in control of whether I reached out to Jesus and said his name for the first time and said, I believe in him. I was in control of whether I attended church. But there were so many things in that moment that I was not in control of. That I did not choose to be given that gift of joy. To have that light turn on in my inner spirit and, and this smile came on my face. And in that moment, joy was not only chosen, it was given as a gift. The Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis, the, writers of, or the writer of the beloved kid's book, The Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote a book called Surprised by Joy. And in the book, he says this, All joy reminds. It's never in possession, always a desire for something. Longer ago or further away, or still about to be. Joy is a gift. It's a gift that points beyond itself to the gift giver, the one who stands behind the gift. And in that moment, when I called out to Jesus, joy was given to me as a gift. But it also directed my attention, my mind, and my heart to the one behind the gift, the great gift giver. That was certainly true for the Magi as well. They chose to go on a journey to take a risk. And in that moment, they also received a gift that was beyond their choice. Gift upon gift. In fact, they got to see the greatest gift ever given in the history of humanity. As they saw the star stop over this house in Bethlehem, they approached the house knocked on the door, and were let in. And they saw this two- to three-year-old child, perhaps sitting in a small crib. That little child was Jesus. 
the living God born in human flesh for the hope of the world. In that moment, they got to see not only the outcome of their choice of joy, but the great gift of joy itself, the coming of Christ. And the joy of Jesus' coming isn't just a 2,000-year-old reality that was good news for a bunch of magi, good news for Mary, good news for Joseph, but good news for us. Even like me, some of the most unlikely travelers, you may be here as well, wondering why you find yourself in a church building on Christmas Eve or seeking anew a deeper purpose and meaning and hope and joy. That joy is a gift. That also means that for those of you whom Christmas is not a season full of happiness and celebration, that it can be given to you too. In fact, we just celebrated our blue Christmas service here, recognizing that Christmas can be one of the hardest seasons for many people. But joy can be something that we choose but even in some of our darkest and most difficult times, can be given as a gift. The invitation for us, friends, 10th Church, as the puppets pointed out to on Christmas Eve, is for us to make space in our busy and chaotic lives to stop, at least for this one day, to turn our hearts, our minds, our attention to the greatest gift ever given. Today at our dinner tables, with our children, at our friends, or even if we're alone, to both choose joy. And even more important, to live with hands outstretched to receive the great gift of joy. The coming of Christ, not just 2,000 years ago, but his presence coming to us today. I'd like to close with the final verse of a very famous Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, one that we sang together earlier. A prayer from a hymn that I think embodies the invitation that we're all invited to, to receive the greatest gift ever given, joy incarnate, the coming of Christ. Would you pray with me? a holy child of Bethlehem, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Would you descend on us today? Would you cast out our sin and enter in? Be born in us today. Amen.